great to see so many people made it here. I think we have a full house today. Uh, so uh, topic for, for our talk is going to be Open Policy Agent, an introduction and a deep dive. Uh, I'm Anders. I work for Styra, the creators and maintainers of OPA, or one of the maintainers. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm Xander. I work on open source at Microsoft. Yeah. Uh, so what we're going to do today, I'm going to give an introduction to OPA for those not familiar. Uh, and uh, followed by some updates from the project. And then Sanders gonna cover uh, the OPA Gatekeeper project. So let's start with an OPA introduction. Uh, and for those not familiar, what, what is even, when we talk about open policy, then it uh, might be good to know what, what is policy in the first place. Uh, so policy is basically a set of rules. Uh, and these rules can be basically anything that a real life rule could be or a real life policy could be. So it could, it could reflect things like organizational rules, how many people are allowed in a, in a room, or things like permissions. Uh, should this user be, uh, should be allowed to perform a certain action given some conditions. Uh, it could cover things like infrastructure or Kubernetes manifests or whatnot. Wherever you can imagine having rules, uh, you can use OPA. Uh, but that's just rules and policy. Well, what we really want to do here is we want to treat policy as code. That is really what the, the kind of movement that uh, I'd say OPA started. What we want to do is we want to work with policy as we work with any other type of code. We want to, we want to test our policies. We want to work with code review, linting, and whatnot. So basically all these uh, benefits that we have are working with anything as code. We want to we want to work with policy the same way. We don't want that to be in, locked into a PDF document or a Word document or, or whatnot. But we want to we want to be able to collaborate on the rules of our system as well. Uh, a key concept of OPA or policy engines in general is that we want to decouple policy from our applications, uh, so that we can do all of these things that I mentioned. Uh, we, we don't want to kind of uh, couple policy with other type of business logic. We want to be able to work with them uh, as an isolated and first class concept. So that's policy. So what's OPA then? It's an open source general purpose policy engine. Uh, and general purpose is important. That's basically uh, one of the kind of core promises of OPA that we should be able to work with one technology to cover all of these use cases. As of February, uh, three years ago, it's a graduated project. I think it was submitted in 2017 or so. So it's, it's been, we've been a, a, around here for a long time. What OPA does is provide us a unified tool set and a framework to work with policy across the whole cloud native stack. And again, we decouple policy from application logic and we try and uh, we separate uh, what we call a policy decision. That's basically what OPA does. It provides us decisions. It doesn't enforce those decisions. That will be up to your application. And what that means uh, is highly specific to the context of that application. So OPA will tell you, no, this user should not be allowed. And then how you choose to enforce that, that is up to you. Uh, policies are written in a declarative language called Rego. I think we'll uh, come back to that in a bit. First, some word on our community. We've been around for a long time, so we have a, a vibrant community of users and contributors. Uh, there's over 100 integrations listed on, on the OPA ecosystem page. So pretty much any technology you choose to work with, you can probably integrate OPA in some shape or form. We have uh, 9,000 GitHub stars, 8,000 Slack users, and uh, hundreds of millions of downloads. Uh, and there's not just the OPA, the core project, but there's uh, a bunch of projects that kind of spun out of OPA, such as uh, OPA Gatekeeper, ConfTest, and so on. And uh, if you, if you want to offer some Rego, write some policy, there's integrations for pretty much any editor out there. So how does it work? How does all these different technologies integrate OPA? It's uh, a fairly simple model, actually. Uh, we call it the policy decision model. It basically works that you have a service. And when we say service, we have a, a quite broad definition of that. It could be, uh, it could be a, a Linux PAM module, a Kafka broker, a microservice, basically anywhere where you have a request 
from a user or other service, rather than trying to make a decision on that, uh, on that request yourself in your service, you delegate that responsibility to OPA. And you say, should this request be allowed or not? Should this deployment be allowed? Or should this or that? Uh, uh, please provide me a, a decision on that. And that's basically what OPA does. And the query we send to OPA is just JSON. And what we get back in, a, in the form of the decision is also just JSON. So it's JSON in and JSON out. So basically any application or stack where you can deal with JSON and possibly an HTTP request, which is probably almost all technologies written in the last 20 years, uh, which explains why OPA is uh, so prevalent. If we zoom in a bit here on, on uh, actual policy evaluation. It, it might look something like this. You have a JSON document. In this case, it looks like an HTTP API sending us a, a query asking, should this be allowed or not? We have a request, we have a user, and we have a policy in between. And this policy says that by default, uh, allow should not be, or allow should be false. And that's a fairly sensible default for an authorization policy. Don't, don't allow anything unless, unless we approve it. Uh, the next condition says allow if admin is in the input user role. So if we have an admin, we should allow it regardless of any other parameters. Uh, that's not the case here. So uh, we're, we're gonna move on to the next allow condition or the next rule in which we say allow read requests or get requests to if the first path component is users. So anyone can read uh, from users. It's not a get request though. That's not what we have in the input. So uh, we're still not allowed. The final allow rule says if it's a put request, which this is, meaning someone is trying to modify a user, then the name of the user must name, match the name of the user in the path. And again, it doesn't. This is Peter trying to modify Anders. So this would, either, this would not be allowed to do. So uh, the end result here is OPA says this is false. So that's basically a crash course into Rego and, and policy evaluation. And of course, again, we're not gonna have to go step through all of this here, but in this case, we have a, a Kubernetes admission review object. Uh, but to OPA, this is just JSON. None of these things actually mean anything. It's just a, a bunch of structured attributes. So we can make policy decisions on anything. And this could be a Terraform plan or, uh, or what have you. So why is OPA? Can't we just write this in Python or Java or whatnot? It's a very common question and it's a valid one as well. So again, one of the ideas behind OPA, and I think the problem becomes apparent when you start to have one team that says, can't we just do this in Python? And in the same organization, you have another team that says, can't we just do this in Java? Or can't we just do this in C Sharp? And, and now you have policies scattered all across the organization, and it's written in different languages. It's very hard to audit. It's very hard to control from a central point or place. Yao Wang from Bloomberg did a, a great talk on Istio and OPA the other day where she said, and somebody asked her, why can't you just use the authorization mechanism provided by Jupyter Hub, or I think it was. Uh, and she said, yeah, we could do that, but OPA provides us a generic way to apply policy consistently across all of our services and systems. So the policy they used for Jupyter Hub, they could use reuse for other use cases. And, and that's kind of the point of, of using OPA and rather than, than uh, trying to solve this just as, an, as something you solve isolated in your team, but trying to kind of uh, try to solve it for, for a whole organization. Some, some more on that. Uh, so what would you use native or OPA over native authorization systems? It's of course this idea that you can share policy across teams or organizations or departments. And this decoupling of policy where you no longer write uh, your policies in the same language as your applications, that means that we can also 
we can centralize management of that. We might have a security team that wants to do audits or reviews of that. And they're not gonna, they're, they might not know all of these programming languages or frameworks, but if they learn one language like Rego, they can work with this across the whole organization. Auditing, and particularly in regulated industries, we, you need to know, and this is one feature of OPA, all these decisions are logged, and they're logged in a uniform format too. So we will, we will have one place where all these logs are stored, and, and we, we know where to go to see what, what, uh, what decisions were made in our systems. And of course, going back to policy as code, we want to be able to test our policies, and we want to test them in a single way as well. Another benefit of this decoupling is that we can, uh, we can do policy updates without having to recompile or redeploy our applications. And we don't, we don't really need to reach out to, to the teams uh, responsible for these applications if we treat policy as a concept of its own. So that was a crash course to OPA. So, uh, now for some project updates. So the big thing going on and we've been working on for, I'd say like the, the last six months or so, is uh, the, an upcoming 1.0 release, where we try to uh, resolve some ambiguities uh, and other things in the language. I think the first commit was 2015, and we've tried to never break, uh, break the contract or backwards compatibilities ever since. Uh, and uh, I should say right away, it, I don't think this is going to be like a huge pain for anyone. We have good, good tooling in place and so on, but, but, uh, but it's basically what, we're, what we need to do for the first time. We're going to have to do some changes in the language. Some of these changes improve readability via some syntax shiver. We'll show, show an example of that soon. But it means the if keyword, the contains keyword are going to be mandatory for, for rules. Future keywords are, uh, or imports are no longer future. That future is now, so that will uh, just go away. Some built-in functions are no longer relevant and will be deprecated or are deprecated already, will just be removed. If you run OPA with strict mode today, uh, you basically have this already. Uh, some things like duplicate imports, uh, using input at data or data as variable names, uh, or using deprecated functions. Uh, and I'd say very few of you are doing this, so should, the impact should be uh, fairly minimal. To provide an example, what a, a Rego policy would look like today, we have, uh, following the package, we have some imports of future keywords. Those are no longer necessary. We will see uh, allow, and it follow, like in the old way, it would just be followed by the the curly braces. Uh, now we can write one-liner rules, if, and we can skip the curly braces. Same thing with uh, the violations rule, which is a rule building a set, a set of strings. In this case, we, we will now, uh, the syntax will be changed to use contains. So as you can see, uh, a bit more compact. Uh, if you so want, you can still use the, the curly braces and, and so on. But, I think, all in all, uh, a more readable way to present a Rego. So what, what can we do to prepare? Uh, there's really no need to wait for, for that release. Basically, all of these things are already in OPA today. Uh, what you can do is you can say, import Rego.v1 in all your policies, and the parser will parse that as uh, a, v, a V1 policy, and if there's anything that not conformant or compliant, it will complain about it. You can even say to the OPA formatter, OPA FMT Rego uh, V1, and it will reformat your source code to, to use if, and to use contains, and to use this import. And the only time where you will need to do some manual modifications is probably if you use input or data as variable names. Those are reserved keywords from now on. Or using one of the deprecated functions. And if you're unsure, am I using a deprecated functions? You, you probably are not. They have, they, these, these functions have not been uh, part of the documentation for, for years. And that's it, basically. Uh, and just as a final thing, we will provide a, a sort of legacy mode. If, if, you, if you do need to run 
uh, perhaps mixed deployments of, of, of modern Rego and older uh, for, for, uh, for uh, the foreseeable future, you, you will be able to do that. You will just have to say that this is, this is older, an older version. I can't update right now for, for whatever reason. And uh, I wrote a blog about it, if, if you're interested to learn more about uh, what Opal 1.0 entails. But it's, it's not a whole lot of more, more than this, but if you, if you prefer that in written form, uh, go check it out. Okay, with that, with that out of the way, what, what, else is, uh, what else is ahead of us? Uh, so a, a few features on, on, on a roadmap. Runtime schema validation of input, uh, meaning if the input data does not conform to what you expect, uh, OPA can fail without even evaluating a policy. Uh, configuration options, just today if you do a typo in your config, that that might be like silently ignored or so, we will be better on, on failing early on in that cases. Open the test runner will be better, will be improved to, to actually, today we'll mostly say like this test failed and you'll have to figure out why. We'll try and improve on that, so we'll actually say this is what you expected and this is what you got. Uh, we're also looking at uh, some built-in or uh, a language addition to better deal with undefined values inside of, of rules. Exactly what that will look like remains to be seen. Rule level tracing is another uh, common request. You have the decision log, which will tell you what, uh, what OPA decided, but it can be hard to try and figure out like how did it get to that decision? So that is something that rule level tracing could help with. Uh, an ellipsis operator to help with things like pattern matching. Uh, I, I think that's kind of would be uh, hard to explain exactly what, how that would look like, but uh, do check the OPA issue board. There's an issue to, to, that describes that. Finally, uh, we're also looking at uh, dependency management or package management or what you want to call it to see like how, how can we improve the situation where, where you can actually share code, work with libraries, and so on. Uh, should just mention, of course, like as with any roadmap, this is a best guess, and we'll see what happens. But this is, these are some of the things we, we intend to work on. If, if there's something you feel strongly about, uh, let us know. Finally, uh, just two cool projects in, our, in the ecosystem right now. Uh, there's a project from Microsoft, it's Regarus, which is basically OPA written in Rust. Uh, I think they have uh, most things covered. Uh, there's still a few built-in functions or so that, are, that might not uh, work as expected, but it's a very cool project, so, so do check, it out. check that out. There's also bindings to a lot of other languages. Uh, there's Regal. I don't know if, if you all used it already. It's a linter for, for Rego, which is also written in Rego itself. But that's a cool project. Uh, I have been uh, involved in that myself, so I, I guess I'm, I'm a bit biased. And that's it for, for me. All right, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about Gatekeeper, and I'm gonna structure this very similarly to the first section here. So those of you that are already avid Gatekeeper users, uh, there's gonna be some repeat information in here, so just bear with me, and we'll get to the the upcoming features towards the end of this. So what is Gatekeeper? At a high level, it is a policy controller for Kubernetes powered by Open Policy Agent. That's the backing engine. Um, I don't know how many folks in this room have ever tried to write a Kubernetes validating admission webhook. Um, I have. It really didn't go well. Um, it's a challenging thing. and. Um, that's not to say that I'm, I'm super great at writing Rego either, but uh, one of the other features that tackles that is there is a robust policy library that accompanies Gatekeeper. Um, so you can find that in our docs. So some of the core features that we really target with this project, first one being admission controls. So you don't have to write those webhooks anymore. Um, we find that like a lot of folks, so like in an ideal world, right? all of your workloads are running on Kubernetes. There's no other form of compute that you have to think about whatsoever. Um, and 
I think for me at least, I know that's not the reality. Um, and so having a system that we can do admission control with in our Kubernetes clusters that also ties in to, you know, OPA in our other systems, you know, utilizes that same ecosystem is a huge benefit to users. So what does admission control look like? Um, this is one of the CRDs, the, the core primitives that we use in this. Um, and this is a constraint template. This is a cluster scoped object and this defines what the policy is. Um, so you can see we've got the properties there which are the, the input and uh, at the bottom, that's the rego um, that was shown a little earlier. Um, so this is where the policy definition lives. I kind of like to think of this as like an interface. Um, from there, we go to an actual constraint. Um, and if the constraint template is the interface, this is the implementation of the interface. Uh, this is a namespace scoped object. And this is what defines how we want to apply and enforce that policy. So in this case, we're saying that we want namespace objects to be subject to that policy that we previously saw. Another large feature here is mutation. So um, just admission control based on the object that's trying to enter the Kubernetes cluster, that, that's one facet of it, but occasionally you will want to change some shape of the data on this object. We see this with things like wanting to have a specific label applied to pods entering a cluster, uh, maybe what team owns it or something like that. So that's where the various mutation operators come into play. They can enact those changes on objects. Um, this is the assign metadata mutator, um, and this does exactly what I alluded to on the previous slide. This adds an owner annotation to all pods or matching the name nginx dash, you get it. And lastly, this is one that we saw a huge gap in when looking at other policy systems initially was auditing. So, and this is a, a gap that, you know, validating admission webhooks themselves leave. Um, you know what the shape of things coming into your cluster looks like, but Having stood up a, a few Kubernetes platforms in my day, I, I know that folks don't always start with policy. Um, usually it's standing up the cluster, getting the initial compute going, and then there's, then there's those early workloads, and then policy occurs somewhere down the line there. How do you have information about all the workloads that are currently running within the cluster? And that's where auditing comes in. It will run through and make sure that all of the resources in the cluster are compliant with the policies that you have in place. Uh, so here's what results from auditing look like. Um, there's a, a few different ways you can consume these. Um, there are some Prometheus metrics that are exposed if you are interested in uh, audit violation counts at a high level. Um, and then beyond that, the audit violations are also uh, added to the status object of the constraint that the object was in violation of. Um, this approach has introduced some challenges too though, so a little preview to, to some upcoming features. Um, so now that you've got the, the very basics down, um, we're gonna talk about what's new. Um, so in the past, when we were putting all of those audit violations on the, uh, the status of the constraint, um, folks that run large clusters with a lot of policies, and like I, I know that these days there are a lot of companies and teams running huge multi-tenant clusters. Um, you'd start to run into etcd limits and, and performance implications with that. Um, so one of the newer features um, that launched is pub sub support for these audit violations. Um, so currently the, the driver that's supported is Dapper backed by Redis. Um, and this is what the structure of that data is gonna look like. Um, and this way, it, it's um, a lot more possible to tie into whatever other systems that you're utilizing. If you're just subscribing to a topic um, on, on Redis, uh, you can follow up you know, that information with whatever additional automation you, you have in place. 
Um, beyond that is integration with the new native Kubernetes object validating admission policy. Um, so I, I don't remember which Kubernetes release this, uh, this one alpha in, um, but uh, it's a, a newer native object for admission. Um, and this way, you know, we've, we've gotten some questions on like, why support this, this native object, you know, isn't Gatekeeper kind of a, a competing um, paradigm to this? And not really at all. I think um, this provides folks the opportunity to work with the uh, cell language or common expression language that, that Google helped develop. Um, if, if you want to use that instead of Rego, this provides you that opportunity. Um, this will just create those underlying admission objects uh, that are native to Kubernetes. Um, another thing where this comes in handy is uh, Gatekeeper has the concept of like external data. So you can use Gatekeeper to consult other systems if you need outside data to make a decision. Um, and being able to then tie in that outside data with validating admission policies is something you wouldn't be able to do strictly with the native object. Um, so this is a very new feature. Um, we will have an alpha of it in our next gatekeeper release, um, but the, the initial PR has been merged on the main branch if anyone wants to go look at it. Um, there's a demo. In, in the main repo right now um, with instructions on how to run that if you'd like to see things actually working. Um, QR code there and a, a little bitly link. Um, check that out. It's, uh, there was a lot of work that went into this over the last six months and I think uh, hopefully folks are excited to try it out. I think you know we on the team were, were really excited about it. Um, and then this is the, the new, new one that is not actually merged at all yet. This is very much a work in progress. We're hoping to have an alpha in our next release, but as always, time will tell. Um, we heard some feedback for folks that were using Gatekeeper and writing policies that they wanted a little bit more granular control over how the policies are enforced. And I think the, uh, the request that actually kicked this discussion off was, what if I want to exclude one constraint from the audit process? I don't feel the need to audit this constraint. Um, and looking at that, it, it opened the door to a lot more granular control over how these policies are enforced. So going forward, we have this feature called enforcement actions, and it is going to allow you to define how each action, how each constraint is enforced at various entry points, like the, the webhook or the gator CLI. Um, and each, you will be able to take different actions per point. Um, hopefully this example here, you can see we've got a deny on this constraint, which is only enforced at the webhook and the gator level. So there wouldn't be any kind of auditing associated with this constraint. And uh, this is not a demo, um, but if you want to see a very detailed design doc of how this is gonna work, Go ahead and take a look here. Um, I started this doc about six months ago and then our engineering team came and made it not bad. So I think it's in a pretty good space right now. Um, there's really good detail on, on how the feature is gonna work and what backwards compatibility is gonna look like. And if you wanna get involved and I, I add this one particularly because we are interested in having folks drop by the community meeting and providing feedback on the enforcement actions design. We are early enough along in that process that we would love to hear input on if this would be a useful feature to you all and if the current API that we have designed actually um, fits what you would expect from something like this. So we have a gatekeeper channel on the OPA Slack and then um, on the GitHub repo, you can find information on when our community meetings take place. They're also on the CNCF calendar. And that's what we got. Uh, yeah, if, if there are any questions, uh, or if not, yeah, there are questions? Good. Uh, I just want to say, like, after... Uh, if you'd rather come and talk with us later, we'll, we'll be in the OPA kiosk in the, in the project pavilion. So we'll, we'll stick around there for, a, for an hour or so after this. So come talk to us there too.
Yeah. So a brief question about mutations. Uh, so do you see any improvement in that area? I'm actually asking specifically because you meant that the constraints will be better targeted, but maybe there's also some room improvement uh, regarding the mutations. So let's say I want only to run mutations on create events to set some defaults, uh, but we have some, some issues with immutable fields, so they will trigger during updates but never work. Sure, yeah, I, um, I don't know of any specific improvements planned to, to mutations, um, the mutators at this point, but um, definitely would love to have you open an issue on that one on the repo and uh, we can talk about it with the team. I think there's definitely a use case there. Thanks. Sorry, I also don't know where you are because the light is like right in my eyes. So if someone asks a question and I'm looking in a completely different direction, like it's, it's <laughs> nothing personal, I swear. Any other questions? Hi, um, might be a slightly basic question, given that I'm a newbie to OPA, but can you give an example of a uh, an implementation, how this would be worked in, let's say, to traffic within a Kubernetes cluster? So there's a couple of different options I can think of about interception and rerouting into OPA, but can you give a typical example on what works well? Uh, sure. So. So yeah, there's a, there's a couple of ways you can integrate OPA. If, if we're talking about something like uh, authorization or app level authorization, the normal deployment pattern in Kubernetes would probably be as a sidecar. So OPA runs on the same uh, host or in the same pod as your application, meaning when you query OPA, it's, like, it's a request to localhost essentially, making it uh, fast, a low latency. Uh, and in some cases, you would modify your application to, to somehow intercept the, the request and send it over to OPA and then deal with the response. There's also uh, the option to put a proxy in front of your application, maybe a service mesh like Envoy Istio, uh, where, where those would be responsible for calling OPA and deal with the result. And that, is, that, that would be preferable if you, don't, if you don't want or can't touch the code of, of your applications. Okay, perfect. Thank you. All right, I think that's it then. If you have any other questions, just come find us in the OPA kiosk here after. Thanks, Thanks everyone.